Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Halle Isfandiari Forum with our special guest speaker, Ambassador Milan Bravir, Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women in Peace and Security. I'm Marissa Khurma, Director of the Middle East Program. I'm truly now honored to welcome the Wilson Center's CEO and President, Ambassador Mark Green, to kick off today's forum. Thank you so much for your time and continued support, Ambassador Green, to the forum, but particularly to all the work that we do at MEP and across the center on the empowerment of girls and women in the MENA region and globally. Ambassador Green. Uh, thanks, Marissa, and good morning, everyone, and welcome to this important event here at the Wilson Center. As you may know, the Wilson Center is unlike other think tanks and policy centers. We were established some five decades ago by Congress with the mission of, in their words, strengthening the fruitful relation between the world of learning and the world of public affairs. That means we don't merely deal in data and information. Congress has asked us to go further, to delve deeper. Our currency is knowledge, our focus is independent analysis, and our purpose is developing ideas and options that power American leadership on today's most important topics. And that's why events like the one today are so important. The Hale Fandiari Forum is a series focused on women's empowerment globally, but particularly in the Middle East and North African region. This initiative, led by the MEP program, honors Hale and her commitment to promoting women's rights and empowerment in the MENA region and around the world. It is a tribute to her outstanding leadership as director of the Middle East program at Wilson from its inception in 1998 through 2015. Four years ago, former Secretary of State Madeleine Albright keynoted our inaugural forum. We've been honored to have speakers, including Senator Chris Van Holland and Dr. Roly Dashti, Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia. This year, we are joined by Ambassador Milan Verveer. Ambassador Verveer is Executive Director of the Georgetown Institute for Women in Peace and Security, but she's perhaps best known for her groundbreaking work as the very first U.S. Ambassador for Global Women's Issues. She has seen firsthand the integral role that women can play, that they must play in peace building and conflict resolution, whether they are at the helm of government civil society or the private sector, women are essential in addressing global threats from violent extremism to climate change and in building more just, more stable, more equitable societies. I can't think of anyone better qualified to lead a discussion on these sweeping issues than Ambassador Verveer. She has shown over and over again her commitment to equal rights and equal opportunities for women everywhere. Under her leadership at the Georgetown Institute, together with the Pryo Center on Gender, Peace and Security in Norway, they've launched the flagship Women in Peace and Security Index. This innovative set of metrics provides much needed insights into patterns and progress on women's status and empowerment around the world and tracks progress or the lack thereof across some 170 countries. The data and analysis this report presents is critical to informing gender responsive policymaking, especially important during the era of COVID-19, which has disproportionately impacted girls and women. I can't help but note that the latest report tragically places Afghanistan at the bottom of the global index. Another bitter reminder of how Afghan girls and women are in danger of losing their most basic rights and freedoms under Taliban rule. Ambassador Verveer has been a driving force in many of the humanitarian efforts aimed at supporting the evacuation of women from Afghanistan. Thank you for your leadership on this, Milan. Deeply appreciate it. And now, without further ado, I will turn it back to Marissa so we can get things underway. Thank you so much, um, Ambassador Green. Um, I'm going to give you the floor, uh, uh, Ambassador Verveer. Um, to tell us a little bit about um, your relationship with Halle, because I know that you were part of the campaign um, that was led here in Washington to free Halle um, from prison um, uh, uh, almost uh, 15 years ago. Well, thank you, Marissa. It's such a pleasure to be able to participate 
uh, in this conversation with you today uh, for the Hale Esfandiari Forum. Uh, let me begin by thanking Ambassador Green for his very generous remarks, but also to say that uh, I think the Wilson Center is in good hands uh, having him at the helm and I haven't had a chance through this COVID uh, period to, uh, to say that personally to him, but uh, I know he's not been at the center for a year yet, but uh, certainly welcome uh, his leadership and his longstanding commitment to uh, values-based uh, issues in so many different ways. Halle uh, is indescribable in terms of what she represents. Uh, she is um, a leader without peer, and she has been an advisor and mentor to me. I am very grateful to Halle over so many years when I would call her, uh, no matter where I was sitting, whether it was um, at Vital Voices, the NGO that I helped start, or whether it was at the State Department, or now, uh, I'd always say, Halle, what do I do in this situation? Uh, but one of the most poignant and terrifying moments for me personally uh, was when she was um, trying to leave um, Iran after having seen her, her mother and uh, other family and detained and then imprisoned. Um, and I think uh, the campaign that was done um, involved her husband, certainly in terms of what he was able to uh, to do globally uh, to uh, remind all of us that she needed to be uh, released. Uh, but the effort that took place from Congress, um, from the United Nations, from so many other places to get her out. Um, and I, I, I still marvel at the fact, and I've asked her over and over how she maintained her equanimity being in that horrible prison uh, for so long. Uh, and she did with a steely, uh, ability to, to maintain her composure uh, in the worst of circumstances. Uh, but the day that she was released was a, a day of great jubilation. She's a very special person. I cannot but wholeheartedly um, agree with that. Um, she's been an inspiration to the work that we're doing um, on the Middle East and a mentor to us as well. Um, Ambassador Verveer, um, your career, as, as Ambassador Green mentioned, um, has been quite um, extensive and quite impressive, particularly on issues pertaining to empowering women globally. Um, and I want to start this conversation today with the latest report that the Georgetown Institute um, recently published, um, uh, which is basically the, the Women in Peace and Security Index. Um, I know that this is, uh, was kicked off in 2017, uh, but I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about the index, its different dimensions, um, and where we are at today, particularly uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, the index uh, is the Women, Peace and Security Index. It's the first index of its kind, uh, comprehensive uh, in terms of uh, its assessment of the condition of women, the well-being of women, and what that represents for peace and security. And the bottom line is that the condition of women and the condition of nations goes hand in hand. The index is different. Uh, there are a lot of great indices out there. I think the one published by uh, you and the Center uh, on, uh, on Women in the MENA region, particularly in the public sector is among them. Uh, but what this index does is it looks at the three dimensions. It's, it's predicated on three dimensions, uh, which is uh, inclusion, justice, and security. Now inclusion, uh, is usually the dominant one that uh, is used across the board because it looks at women's political participation, economic participation, um, issues that uh, really come to the fore. But what this one does is it adds justice. Are women discriminated against and what are those structural impediments uh, that affect their progress? And it adds security. Are you secure in your home? Are you secure in your community? So if a girl, for example, uh, in inclusion is able to go to school, but if she is uh, not secure in her classroom or going to school in her home, obviously her degree, her well-being uh, is highly constricted. 
Uh, and, and we look at 170 countries now, it's for all the countries for which data is available and data is so critically important, uh, particularly sex disaggregated data. Uh, and it's not based on any new, new uh, uh, data sets. It, we use globally available, highly recognized sets to do this analysis. Uh, and what we find uh, is in that range of 170 countries, uh, you've got the top 10 being largely um, the Nordic countries and others uh, predominantly in Europe. Uh, and then you've got those at the bottom, as Ambassador Green said, at the very bottom is, is Afghanistan. Um, but, but so are many countries like Iraq, like Syria, uh, like Yemen. Uh, and what we find is a, a correlation between the well being of women uh, and what that represents for prosperity, for peace, uh, and conditions of women. Uh, that are the polar opposite and what that represents for instability, for conflict, uh, for an erosion of uh, all of the kinds of uh, standards that one wants to see. Uh, so it's, it's that kind of an analysis. And uh, overall, I think globally, uh, we see in 90 countries now, since the last index was published two years ago, uh, some improvement, about 5% improvement, uh, but in terms of uh, the larger global uh, space beyond those 90 countries, we actually see a reduction uh, in progress by some, some 2%. Uh, so I think it has um, an important role to play. Uh, and our hope is that it is used by policymakers and, and advocates alike uh, to really try to improve, uh, work to improve uh, the condition of women. Um, and one of, one of the most interesting uh, or perhaps not surprising uh, reactions um, when, when the index is released at multilateral sessions, United Nations, for example, the first thing all of the leaders do is point to the, go to the rankings to see where their country is. Well, one can only hope that if the, the ranking uh, is, uh, is less than propitious in terms of where they should be, that they will do something about it. And I just wanna add one thing about the MENA countries because um, you know, let's say one is a top place to be, uh, imagine 170. There are but two countries uh, in, in the MENA region that are above 100 out of 107 countries, and that's uh, the UAE and, and Qatar. Uh, the rest are, you know, further down. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done in the region, obviously. Thank you. Yes, indeed, there's a lot of work to, to be done. And um, I noticed also that on the legal front in particular, um, according to the report uh, this year, that the MENA region is the worst performing region um, with a very low legal um, score. Now, I really also think that it's... Um, equally important as you have um, described that the justice component not only looks at the laws but looks looks at also sort of informal discrimination right which is which i guess you can capture through perceptions or social norms so when what the report noted um, is that the, a large share of men who believe um, it's unacceptable for women to have paid work outside of the home is the largest in the region. And that explains why the MENA region, according to the Global Gender uh, Gap Index, continues to rank at the bottom, particularly with um, women's labor force participation. Um, and, I, and I wanna sort of touch upon one point that you made, which is how leaders react to the rankings, that you, would, you hope that this is at least some sort of incentive for them to do better. But that really goes back to political will. So when, when you have these bilateral conversations beyond the general presentations with the governments about the need to address some of these legal issues, um, what is the reaction and, and how do you navigate through these, these difficult conversations very often? Well, you know, that's a really interesting point. I just wanna make one other point about the index and thank you for mentioning 
um, the fact, because one of the, the criteria, as you said, in justice uh, is, uh, is, the, is the perception or the position of whether or not women should work outside the home. And that's very, very telling, of course. But the biggest gap in, in, in terms of uh, any region is uh, from the top to the bottom. You've got a huge, huge discrepancy. So you've got the UAE at the top, for example, but you've got Syria at the bottom and lots in between with Libya maybe being in the middle. Um, but in terms of, of persuading, uh, advocating, working with leaders, I have found over the years um, that I really have to think about their self-interest because you, know, you can make the best arguments on moral grounds and for all of us, I think, uh, human rights, women's rights, this is the right thing to do. It's, it's obviously each and every woman uh, should have her dignity protected and uh, her rights uh, advanced and protected. Uh, but for many decision makers, that's not even a starting point. Um, but the other piece is the evidence-based case. It's something that you do uh, at the Wilson Center. It's something that we do uh, at Georgetown. And that's to demonstrate uh, through the evidence that this objectively has huge payoffs. And I really think that oftentimes it's self-interest, perhaps all the time, it's the self-interest motivation. And I remember one time um, when I was ambassador and this, there were various variations of this kind of experience where I'd meet with the leader and the meeting was set up and the leader would say, it's so lovely to meet you, you know, really glad you came to our country. I don't have time to be involved in a, in a discussion with you, but this young woman here, I'm sure she'd be delighted to, to pursue these issues with you. And I remember one time saying, you know, sir, I really regret uh, that this is the case because I wanted to talk to you uh, about how uh, your economy in your country can grow. Uh, and, his whole disposition changed. And he said, well, I might have a little time, uh, but I think it was one of those things where you're coming to talk about women, I'm not interested. But if you're coming to talk about how I can grow my economy or how it might be of greater interest to me, you know, essentially taking an issue that we know is central, not marginal, but what is perceived to be marginal and move it to the middle in terms of the interests of um, a leader uh, it can help. It's not the magic bullet. Uh, it, it takes a lot of effort, uh, but I do think that one has to uh, really make arguments in these kinds of circumstances uh, that focus on uh, why it is in the interest of you as a political leader uh, to make these kinds of changes and how to do it. Absolutely, and that's um, in fact why the World Bank uh, reframed uh, women's economic participation as smart economics for countries to, to uphold. So um, as you said, it's the framing that really um, uh, gets uh, some of the leadership interested in, well, how does this um, affect um, our economy and, um, and then our national uh, security? Well, and I think, um, Marissa, that one of the things that has uh, changed in significant ways is the kind of work that we're both involved in, uh, which has to do with uh, using data uh, and, and creating data sets that, that can have impact in these situations. You know, the kinds of work that Mackenzie has done, for example, in demonstrating mm -hmm. what a difference women's economic participation makes uh, literally they're, uh, in terms of everything from their purchasing power uh, to uh, the, the ways that uh, economies can grow, even if you looked at the best economies today and the others followed suit. Uh, but again, even they show that you've got to make changes in some of these situations that are the hurdles and the obstacles, many of which you've already mentioned. Uh, but but unless you do that, you cannot unleash the economic force that women represent. Absolutely. Um, and that brings us to, um, I guess, talking a little bit about how the pandemic has affected women because um, job losses um, across the globe, um, 
primarily here in the United States, uh, were very much amongst women. Um, and how does how does this year's index um, capture that? And what are the trends that you have um, unraveled? Well, as you know uh, so well, COVID had a disproportionate impact on women. Uh, but it also, in the process, exposed the inequalities that women still find themselves contending with. Uh, so much of that disproportionate impact was really the result of the of the of the standard and the situation in which women find themselves. So in the United States, as you said, but not just in the in the United States, certainly in the MENA region as well, in terms of employment. Uh, tremendous declines. I think uh, several economists coined the situation here, but certainly it could be true elsewhere uh, as not a, uh, a recession, but a, see, a she session because the greatest impacts uh, fell on women in terms of employment. Some of that obviously, um, and certainly that's true in the United States had to do with the childcare situation and, and and trying to do your work when your children are not in school uh, and you've got the, the uh, responsibilities uh, that, that contend with each other and are impossible at times uh, to really deal with. Um, the other thing we saw was an alarming, uh, um, alarming rate of increase in violence against women uh, and, and, and just how, um, inadequate the response was. Uh, you know, we didn't learn from Ebola, for example, uh, in terms of what was needed when that occurred in that situation, not at the same rates, obviously, uh, but you need to have these resources available, uh, whether it's shelter or other kinds of protection uh, to help women in these kinds of situations. And then I think for, for much of the developing world and certainly impacts in, in the MENA region is, what it's done to education, particularly education for girls. Huge numbers of dropouts and whether or not they get back to school still remains to be seen. And there are great fears about the toll uh, that it's taken on education because um, with the lockdown, with their being out of school, with um, obligations placed on them uh, in their families to, to somehow find income, We've seen dramatic increases in violence against girls, in trafficking, uh, in all kinds of uh, horrific abuses, uh, let alone the fact that they won't go back in many of these instances to continue their education. So huge tolls out of COVID. Uh, all of those are not reflected in the index because of when it was released, but I think in the next index, uh, we will see even more significant um, impacts, but certainly in education, uh, in violence against issue and in women in the workforce, uh, tremendous negative impacts. That is going to take us a while. And I hope we do, inshallah, as we would say in these circumstances, build back, but build back in a way uh, that doesn't continue the inequalities that have uh, created um, the exacerbation of these problems for women that COVID represented. Absolutely, um, and I, I wanna do a quick follow-up to this um, question, but I also want to um, invite our audience to submit a question uh, to Ambassador Revere by emailing mep at wilsoncenter.org, or you could do that via Twitter, um, at Wilson Center MEP. Um, so the follow-up to this with, with regards to um, the, the pandemic in particular, and, and you said that at the outset in your response, that it sort of um, highlighted the inequalities. Um, and in a way, it also uh, showcased how dependent um, the systems in, in place, in communities, families, society, on women, uh, women at home, as well as in the workforce. Um, in the MENA region, the vast majority of the healthcare staff and the first responders in healthcare are women. And, and then, so, so in some countries, not all countries, there, there, has, there had to be a switch in gender roles because the women were the nurses. And those were, you know, ironically, those are the professions 
that the curricula um, in some parts of the region, including you know, country where I was born and raised, Jordan, um, uh, encourage women to go. But then when a pandemic hits, guess who's gonna, gonna have to go to work and who stays home to take care of the kids? So how do you, how do you see the pandemic as perhaps a, an, also an opportunity? Well, I think you just said it. Uh, you know, it reminded me in some ways of a, of a story I heard um, with respect to Afghanistan, not with not recent story, but uh, back when a group of uh, uh, entrenched uh, warlord types were complaining uh, that uh, children were not well and uh, women were dying in childbirth and they were complaining that they needed they needed that expertise. They needed women to do these kinds of things. And the person who they were complaining to said, well, then you shouldn't stop having girls go to school because these very same people didn't want girls to go to schools or certainly to get an education that would be anything like uh, an education in, in, in the medical profession. And I think you, you can't have it both ways. Uh, you're going to pay a price is, is what you just indicated. Uh, as well. Um, and that, and what you said about the meta region is also true. Uh, it's been true here as well and everywhere in the world. Women have been on the front lines of responding to the COVID, uh, the, the COVID repercussions. Uh, and, and at the same time, you know, they have been placed in a, in a, in a situation that uh, doesn't want them to do these kinds of things on the outside in the uh, in the not in the broader sense, uh, and then when push comes to shove, you realize the price that is paid and how needed they are. So we can't have it both ways. And I think this goes back to uh, the smart thing, the strategic thing, the you know the the ways that we have to come to understand um, the important role that women play, whether it's in, what whether it's in healthcare, whether it's in economies. Uh, whether it's in education uh, and, and in their families as well. Uh, we've got to make it possible uh, for women to be able to exercise their rights and to be able to um, engage uh, in ways that uh, they can take uh, advantage of the opportunities that they should have uh, to be able to pursue uh, the goals that they set. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to uh, gender-based violence, particularly because you also highlighted how we've seen a surge. Many have called it a um, have called it this a pandemic of of gender-based violence because of the surge that we've seen since COVID nineteen. Um, how how do we navigate through gender-based violence, um, especially in your conversations with governments because it seems that those who are working the work and you know walking the talk are mostly women at the grassroots level civil society but there's a role for the private sector and the government so how do you convince them that this is something that they really need to invest in well it's a fundamental challenge and i couldn't say uh, it better in terms of where we are and what we need to do uh, the problem is pervasive. There is no part of the world that is untouched uh, by, by this violence. Uh, the violence in conflict areas is exacerbated, the violence against women, um, as well as when conflicts decline and you've got the reintegration of soldiers back into their families, et cetera. You, you don't see a decline in domestic, for, uh, domestic violence, for example. You often see an uptick. So we, we've got a problem across the board. Um, and I think fundamentally it's attitudinal, uh, how you perceive of, of violence exercised uh, against women. Is it simply a collateral of a conflict? Is it something we have to live with? You know, there was the time uh, and it still is the attitude of some that it's a private matter. Uh, you don't, you don't, have anything to do with it, it's going to be resolved in the family. Um, but it's not private and it's not cultural. Uh, it is criminal 
and no woman should have to, and, and, and men are abused too, but predominantly no woman should have to um, be a victim of abuse. Whether she knows the universal doctrine of human rights or not is irrelevant. She knows that she should not be um, dealt with in, in this way. And, you know, I think we are all struggling with various ways to address it. Uh, I think norms are a huge obstacle and we've got to get at mindsets, we've got to get at attitudes, we've got to get at these biases. Um, and one way to do that is obviously to bring in male allies. Uh, you know, I've had, I, I had, uh, I've had several experiences uh, with the change that can overcome when there's a real effort to do this. And a few years ago, um, I remember announcing a program in India to deal with violence against women. And it was a simple proposition. It was working at that grassroots level to change attitudes. Uh, and it was um, resources that men in the village were going to get to engage in, um, you know, local theater uh, to, to, because nobody was formally educated, but to understand that this is not the way one conventionally lives. Uh, it was not the way it is, <coughs> excuse me. And, uh, you know, I, I, they staged the skit in front of me and it was all men performing. And when they went clearly to, to hit a woman, you know, the, the hand was lifted back, et cetera, in the skit. And then sometime later, the head of this NGO that was uh, supporting this project said, you know, the men wanna talk to you again. And I was in the States, this was in India. And I said, well, the next time I come over, maybe we can arrange it. And when I did, I didn't know what to expect from these men. I didn't know if they were gonna complain to me. I didn't know if they were gonna tell me they had you know, change the situation in their village. I didn't know what, why they wanted to speak to me. And when I asked them, they, I, I, first thing I said is, has the violence against women in your villages gone down? Oh yes, 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 not, not the problem it was. But then they said to me, what we wanna tell you is we have changed. We no longer see this as the kind of behavior we should engage in. We are different people. Abusing women is not part of our lives. And it's that kind of transformation one has to see um, in, in the kind of behavior that's been affected. You know, we just marked the 25th anniversary of the Beijing Women's Conference. Uh, and, and that was about women's rights as human rights. Uh, and it was the women from Africa in this case, who in a previous gathering realized that this is an issue that has to be dealt with. Uh, and it became a predominant discussion um, in, in Beijing uh, in terms of women's rights as human rights. And when international law um, finally included uh, women's rights as, as part and parcel of, of the rights of women, not something marginal to or separate from, this began to bring about legal change. And we saw a plethora of laws being passed in country after country. But as you know, and your audience knows so well, many of these laws have not been implemented or resourced. Uh, so I think we, we do need uh, to find ways uh, to bring about male allies, uh, traditional leaders, religious leaders. I've seen firsthand in many places uh, where it's been the village fathers, if you will, uh, or the imams at the local level who have begun a process after they were persuaded. Uh, but governments have to recognize, and the private sector has to recognize, this creates a toll, not just in terms of the women who are victimized and their families, but in terms of productivity, the losses are enormous, in terms of the costs uh, for healthcare and other uh, issues that have to be dealt with, there are huge repercussions, first and foremost, to the survivor, uh, but huge repercussions for all of society in this. We all lose uh, when women lose uh, in, in this situation. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for highlighting um, 
the role of men in this equation uh, because um, gender development studies, for example, have always sort of uh, zoomed in on uh, the feminist agenda, but there's also um, masculinity and what that means. And, and the, uh, the story you told um, is quite emblematic of how this masculinity evolved or what it means to be, uh, because in many instances, it's very much tied to your definition of who you are as a man or as a woman, right? So exactly. Th this is this is a really fascinating example. Um, and I, it, I hope that the, yeah. And it's about power, you know, the power over you. We've got to change the power yeah. dynamic. And if women even, you know, this affects women in the in the poorest situations, but it also affects women so we've learned from the Me Too movement, if we didn't know, uh, in, in the halls of power. But there are so few of them uh, that the power dimensions are not dealt with. And just a quick story out of Jordan, uh, since I know yes. that that is um, your, your ancestral homeland. Mm -hmm. I remember doing some work in Jordan on this issue, and it was very controversial, as it is in many uh, uh, societies that are are quite conservative on on uh, recognizing uh, this is certainly not just a, a private matter, and I I uh, heard many a story about how uh, men would come after NGOs or others in government who were working on this issue and say, "What right have you uh, to interfere with my family? This is my business," um, and a lot of it work that went on became definitional. So the, the, the discourse of violence against women uh, was changed to family protection. And family protection was understood, was more readily embraced, uh, was not seen as casting uh, stones, uh, but as something we together had to address. Uh, and a holistic way of dealing with the outcomes of what this violence um, uh, impacted, how it, how, it, how it hurt people uh, was through this view of, we have to protect the family. Uh, and in the family was obviously the abused uh, woman in many cases, a child, uh, but the whole family suffers in this. So I found working in that space yeah. Um, very illuminating uh, in terms of how communications matter. Oh, absolutely. And like you said, reframing it uh, with a focus on the family instead of uh, instead of uh, solely on, um, you know, blaming the man, even though they are the perpetrators. of. Uh, and I the, think to this violence. day, there are centers that have been set up there that are family centers. Uh, yeah. And uh, and it, it's not something horrible uh, to be uh, to to be brought there to be safe uh, because it is about the family and it's it goes back to not just the right thing to do but also uh, the smart thing to do. It's reframing, uh, I think, is is critical if you want to make progress in a lot of these tough situations. Yeah. Absolutely. So we're going to turn to uh, some of the questions that we've received. Um, and the first one is from Hale. Um, uh, you have mentioned um, Afghanistan. Ambassador Green mentioned Afghanistan. The report um, uh, tragically puts Afghanistan at the, at the bottom. And of course, uh, this is a very challenging time for um, girls and women. Um, and I, I, I want to read the question and then um, invite you to talk a little bit about the initiative that you have been involved with to also um, help support uh, women at risk. So um, Hale's uh, question, uh, how does a master of Revere think one can convince the Taliban to change their attitude towards women and integrate them once again in the society? Well, you know, ta uh, Hale always asks the hardest questions. Uh, I wish we knew the answer to that question. Um, it is a slow process for, for one, the Taliban are not a monolithic group. Uh, it's, there are Taliban that put out one statement uh, about how we wanna see girls in school, we wanna see women participating, uh, and then 
often there's a phrase about within the context of our religious values, and that should be the first sign because their definition um, or their holding of the most extreme radical uh, understanding, as, as many Muslims say to me, it has nothing to do with religion. It's they're using religion as this veneer because they've essentially hijacked religion when they say something like that or hijacked Islam. Uh, so, so one way is to slowly demonstrate um, uh, how consistent uh, Islam is with women's rights. And there's a lot of work that women have been doing uh, in that space. But there are also a lot of um, Taliban who, who, who don't get it, uh, who, who perhaps maybe I, what I should say is aren't persuadable. Uh, but I think uh, it is a very, very challenging, difficult process. Uh, one of the negotiators in Doha, one of the women Afghan negotiators told me that when she would uh, face her, her Talib colleague on the other side of the table, he wouldn't look at her. He kept his eyes down because she was not worthy to be looked at in these circumstances for fear of God knows what kind of terrible thing would happen to him. But she said over time, the more she talked, uh, you know, the more there was uh, an opening. I can't say it's a conversion, but an opening. Um, right now, there is an unfolding of a catastrophe in Afghanistan in terms of the humanitarian situation. Upwards of 80% of the people are said to be starving. Um, there's a fuel crisis, it's bitter cold. Uh, the healthcare system has collapsed. Education is on the brink of the same. Um, and the Taliban are saying uh, they need to have um, support to be able to overcome this situation. Well, I think that's a lever. Uh, certainly humanitarian aid needs to get in in a way that the Taliban are not in charge of the distribution of the resources and, and that is happening. But in the longer term, how do we use that lever? They wanna be recognized on, on, at the United Nations and in other ways as a legitimate government of that country. That is a lever. Um, they, they wanna be um, viewed uh, differently than the global perception of them. Uh, they want to see a place uh, like Afghanistan not totally collapse, even though they know nothing about governing. So I think we have to strategically in the international community certainly use these levers and continue to work with the women. And you know, 60% plus of that country is under the age of 25. Those young people have a vision of a different kind of Afghanistan. They are not going to contend themselves uh, to the best that they can exercise uh, any of their abilities as a group uh, to accepting this. So I think it's different forces. Will it change the Taliban? Will they accept women? Um, you know, some of the things that have happened already are very terrible in terms of the threats that have been issued on women's lives. Uh, in terms of pulling women out of the universities, uh, you know, girls out of school, um, in terms of moving women out of the key jobs in civil service, these are not good signs, uh, but we have to figure out how we can use the levers that we have uh, to, to get some slow uh, ability to keep the worst from happening in terms of uh, the pushback on the kinds of achievements that have occurred, uh, let alone move them forward. Uh, thank you for that. And I was um, I was struck in an, in um, my conversation with two Afghan young women um, last month uh, that they also looked at it the same way. That they thought, yes, let's keep the dialogue going with the Taliban, um, and they will have to see why this is important. Uh, so this is a really good, and and I mean that was quite um, disarming to hear that from them because they they fled Afghanistan because they were threatened, but they still see dialogue as the way moving forward, um, and as you said, using this um, this uh, uh, lever to deal with um, with the Taliban government. Um, 
so we have a, a number of other questions coming in. Uh, one from uh, our own, one of our own um, MEP fellows, David Ottaway. Are there any MENA countries where conditions for women are improving uh, today? If so, what are the what are these countries? Well, I think you all are the experts uh, of that more than I am. Uh, but I, if I were to look at the uh, index that we have put together, uh, certainly what, what the UAE and Qatar have done uh, have uh, stood out uh, in terms of, of political representation, workforce participation across government, for example, uh, a more a sense of uh, a more inclusive, uh, more inclusive um, uh, progress uh, that is recognized as important to the future of the of the countries. I think that you know whether it's on the global stage and how they're seen, or whether it's seeing what difference it makes within the country. Um, Cutter's uh, commitment to education, for example, uh, and, and what they're trying to do in, in, in the region as well on that score. Uh, the UAE's uh, work in terms of, of women in, um, in ministries, uh, real power, uh, it's not decorative, it's, it's real power that they have. Uh, and it's an example, I think both and other countries trying to uh, get at women's economic participation. I think this is so critically important. Even in the times when there was minimal progress on other issues, the less threatening way to engage women uh, was economically because it was so important uh, in terms of both their lives and uh, the economies of those countries, many of which are not um, all wealthy as some of the Gulf countries are. And enabling them to, to start businesses, not just microcredit, but small businesses that you know, have that force in terms of moving economies uh, forward. Uh, but but you know, the access to finance is a huge challenge. Uh, one of the things that happened with the WeFi program uh, was the you know, commitment of, of resources focused on the region. And hopefully that's had a greater impact because access to finance is just a, a it, it's a bit, it's a shortfall in the billions of dollars worldwide for women in business, but it's certainly a big problem in the region. Access to markets. I've had so many conversations uh, with women in the Middle East. How do they take their product? How do, how do you enhance those products? How do you get the markets for them? Uh, if I had, you know, hours to describe uh, this frustration of how we can get where we need to get and have viable markets, that's critical. Training obviously is foundational to all of that. Technology increasingly is important. Uh, and I think that, that economic opportunity and, and participation is the portal in many ways in these countries uh, through which uh, women can then become much more engaged as they've got that economic livelihood. Uh, it also is a retardant on violence against women uh, and, and be able to move out into greater societal participation. Um, but in terms of the countries, obviously it's such a, such a, a, a mix uh, in the region because you've got those who are really making progress You've got those who are mired in conflict and horrific situations. Uh, and then you've got, you know, this middle uh, that hopefully is moving forward. But I look to all of you as the experts uh, on this one. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ambassador Vivir. Uh, we were just in Bahrain and we got to meet um, women entrepreneurs. And um, having heard their stories, it, it struck it struck us how important it was that they had been through all these incubators and accelerators that provided them with uh, access to finance, uh, mentorship, as you mentioned, the training and capacity building, uh, but also how to access other markets in the region and, and globally. So those are absolutely uh, key. You know, when I was uh, at the State Department, we had a number of programs, and I think they still exist, 
uh, but one was mentoring uh, mm. where uh, particularly a, a large focus was on the Mena region uh, to, um, to couple the mentee from the region with mentors uh, in, in business who could enable them to tackle some of the biggest mm -hmm. challenges they had. But we also innovated with technology and we had tech women and tech girls. And mm -hmm. <laughs> excuse me, I remember our ambassador in one of the MENA countries saying to me that he hosted the girls before they were about to leave for the United States and this big uh, tech uh, training opportunity. And he said, I couldn't contain their enthusiasm because they were so focused on what they wanted to do, what they wanted to achieve. Uh, and they saw this as an opportunity for them uh, to be able to uh, surmount some of the hurdles that they were confronting. And I think these kinds of programs on a scale that obviously needs to grow are, are critically important uh, uh, to enable economic progress, um, whether it has to do with access to finance, uh, to markets, to mentoring, training, and that whole basket of issues. But technology is another big one. Absolutely, thank you. Another um, last question from Colonel Lisa um, Terreau, if I pronounce this correctly, a US Air Force fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. The US National Action Plan for Women in Peace and Security was created under President Obama in, in 2011. What is your perspective on the US implementation since its inception of uh, WPS across the US government agencies, particularly in MENA? Any thoughts on tangible um, whole of US government efforts to promote inclusion, justice, and security for women in the region? Well, I think the latter uh, we have to do more vigorously. Uh, but for those in your audience who may not know, um, the national action plans, the United States not only has the plan uh, that happened when I was in government, uh, that basically as President Obama said at the time, this tells us we must do our diplomacy, our development work and our defense work bearing in mind the perspectives of women and the participation of women to have better outcomes uh, when it comes to peace and security. Uh, there are several, I think something like eight in the MENA region, but some of these NAPs, National Action Plans, are check the box exercises where you stand up and you say, we have a National Action Plan, and frankly, it doesn't do a whole lot. Others have been very serious propositions. And the biggest, even where they've been more formulaic, if you will, getting women in rooms with leaders and decision makers, which the NAP essentially is supposed to do, begins to create, because it's a government and um, larger society partnership uh, in terms of peace and security. So the United States, to your question, to your viewer's question, uh, has been engaged. Uh, more vigorously and then not so vigorously. And now I think we're back to trying to do a better job. I have to salute the Congress on a bipartisan way because Congress uh, was instrumental, obviously, in passing uh, the National Action Plan law. We are the only country in the world that has one. And it's going to be critical for Congress to uh, create the kind of accountability that needs to happen to ensure. Uh, that the plans that have been put together by the State Department, by USAID and DOD uh, are realized. And, and now looking back on those plans, where do they need to be improved? Uh, where do they need to be um, uh, bolstered? Because some are not as adequate as others. Uh, but I think that combination of commitment within our own government agencies that have responsibilities, um, as well as resourcing uh, that is critically necessary uh, in these cases, uh, but working closely with other countries uh, to be able to do a better job in terms of um, what, what women can do in conflict situations as peace builders, what, it, what can happen in terms of civil society, uh, in terms of more official uh, discussions, um, 
that the United States is a partner in that to the extent that we can be. And in, in the societies that are post-conflict, but still very much enmeshed in conflict, women have to be part of that recovery process, that relief process, whether it's, it's what kind of government structures emanate out of that, are we gonna have kind of change? Um, Iraq does not seem to be a great example right now of what should be happening. Uh, and also issues like women's role in the economies of build, rebuilding those countries. Uh, again, they are often marginalized. So this is an issue that isn't one just one small way if we do this, we address peace and security. It really requires across the board uh, efforts in terms of prevention, participation, relief and recovery, and dealing with conflict, dealing with um, sexual violence that comes out of these uh, conflicts. Thank you. Um, and, and one thing that you also uh, pointed to um, is ensuring that women are at the negotiating table, not only negotiating peace agreements, uh, but other things that fall under that. Water, for example, uh, we've, we've done some work with our environmental uh, uh, security and peace program on the role of women in water negotiations, when women are usually the ones who manage water resources in the home, they're never consulted on how some of these agreements um, are forged. Well, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned that, Marissa, because there's a the story about a post-conflict situation in the MENA region uh, where the negotiators, you know, the combatants on, on both sides, they were the negotiators, no women at the table, and they were uh, in the midst of uh, not being able to make any progress. And the women got word of what the problem was that these guys weren't moving forward. And they were arguing over the water rights and the women could have told them there was no water in that, in that lake for the longest time because the women <laughs> depended on that water uh, or it's, it's demining, you know, not focusing on the areas where the agriculture is done and the food is produced. Uh, where, which should be a top priority in demining. So you're right, so many decisions, but I also think we, we would uh, be sorely missing a major issue if we don't mention climate change, uh, because that is the existential threat of our time. Uh, it is uh, a threat producer and what we're seeing, uh, and we're gonna see in spades in the MENA region, the, the soaring uh, heat waves, the droughts, uh, they are at a rate higher than other parts of the world with long-term implications. This has got to be factored in to the strategic plans uh, for the region. And women are absolutely critical. And there is a nexus um, between climate, women, displacement, competition for resources, growing competition, and conflict. Mm -hmm. So we really, again, need to bring women into the solution uh, and we really need to focus on this issue from the get-go. Absolutely, um, and thank you for uh, for bringing up uh, climate change um, in this conversation. We have uh, uh, a few minutes left. Uh, this has been a very enriching conversation. Um, so my last question to you um, really is more of a personal one because this this journey that you've been on working. Um, uh, working on women's issues um, globally and in the United States, um, I guess you've seen progress, you've also seen some setbacks. So what are some of your lessons learned that you can share with us and the audience uh, that could help inform our work, um, but also inspire others to continue the work despite the challenges Well, first ahead? of all, I, I think what keeps me going, I know for a fact, uh, is the extraordinary efforts of women on the front lines of change everywhere. They may not be recognized, uh, but they are really the face of change. Uh, and we need to change the face of leadership so that more women can be in that construct, if you will, uh, really moving their, their societies forward. So I would say certainly first and foremost to understand just how critical it is to unleash the talent, the potential, the experiences of half the population of the world. It is still largely untapped, but when we shortchange women, we are shortchanging our societies. And I've said till I'm blue in the face,
judge that progress, it is going to also affect men and boys. So that has to be recognized uh, that we are all in this together and this is a critical uh, need to move forward on. We have to better understand, and I think the data today has made a difference, creating that evidence-based case, that work is uh, essential work, is particularly in, in terms of working with decision makers, uh, framing the issues in a way that <coughs> those who on whom we are still largely responsible because women have not moved into many of these positions, uh, see this as something that is in the self-interest of their countries uh, and their governments and their effectiveness. Um, so, you know, it's not that there's been one solution, uh, but it is often very frustrating that with all we know, with all that has been done, you know, some of the statistics show that it will be another hundred years until we can reach parity. That's unconscionable. <coughs> And so we need to really accelerate this progress. And I think it's up to all of us. Uh, and in fact, I, I co-wrote a book called Fast Forward and, and it's really predicated on, if we're gonna go forward faster, we need all of us engaged. We need to take this data. Uh, we need to come together. We need to understand that the aggregate is bigger than uh, what we might do individually as important as that is, but coming together to solve certain ones of these issues. Um, so I, I believe that acceleration is where we need to be right now. Uh, mm -hmm. And that means not just these structural changes, these, these steps in progress, important as they are, but that women once and for all can access power, the power of decision-making, the power to be at the table, and the power to take that experience that is so critical and tap it. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time, for your commitment um, to girls and women worldwide um, and, to, um, and for your leadership. Um, thank you all for joining us um, uh, today at the 2021 Hallis van der Forum. And uh, we will continue the discussion. Happy holidays as well. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa.